I feel I should salute the most dedicated and hardiest members of the conference for being here at this hour, while others are sleeping or going to the beach or eating breakfast. I'm going to um, talk about uh, organ transplantation in the context of a reciprocal benefit. And the outline for my talk is here. I'm going to begin by reminding us of what a great accomplishment organ transplantation is, not only medically, but legally discuss briefly the curse of success that attends organ transplantation and how in response to that, uh, some physicians have been willing to push for a system which would um, try to save the lives of their own patients but by endangering others. I'll remind you of the 35 years of organized opposition to that notion of organ sales and uh, deal with what is the central problem, which is that it would appear that limiting the ability of people to go out and obtain organs by incentivizing others to give it to them for uh, some payment of some sort would reduce the number of transplants. And I'll conclude by showing that the paradox is that combating organ sales actually has led to a higher level of transplantation. So let's look back at the, the history here. In the early 1950s, there were nine attempts made to transplant human kidneys, all of which failed. And it was only... Um, uh, not only that five of them failed basically on the operating table, that the uh, recipient did not uh, recover uh, uh, urine production at all and uh, expired. Um, and others, the other four, uh, failed within 180 days. Nevertheless, in some of those early cases, the uh, enthusiastic physicians made public announcements and then only later had to acknowledge that the transplant had not actually succeeded. But on December 23, 1954, a team at Peter Bent Brigham Hospital led by Joe Murray uh, transplanted the kidney from 23-year-old Ronald Herrick to his identical twin, Richard, whose kidneys were failing. And Dr. Murray had learned a lesson from those first nine attempts. And the Herrick transplant was not actually announced to the public for nine uh, or 10 months, and not until the following November. Um, Dr. Murray then went on and performed the first successful allograph, and in 1962, the first cadaveric renal transplant. The recipient died um, nine years later, a little bit uh, less than nine years later, in March of 1963. In 1990, Dr. Murray was awarded the Nobel Prize, shared the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine, and Ronald Herrick, the donor, lived 56 years and died in 2010. So that's the early history that actually showed both the success for the recipient, who got an extra eight and a half or so more years of life, and the donor who lived um, uh, to be uh, almost 80 years old. And so his life was not compromised by having been a donor. Uh, but human organ transplantation is not only a great triumph for surgery and the related fields of medicine in terms of the support of the donor, the development of uh, immunosuppression, uh, and also, of course, the development of screening and counseling uh, for the psychological issues that arise not only for the donor and recipient, and, and actually, um, uh, Richard Herrick um, really objected to his brother at the last moment. He said, go home. They were both in the hospital. They were being uh, prepared the night before. He said, no, no, you, you go home. 
you shouldn't be doing this. And, and that psychological issue remains uh, as an issue in many uh, transplants. But it's also a psychological issue f and an ethical issue for um, surgeons. And indeed, uh, Joe Murray was widely criticized at the time for having exposed the donor to an unnecessary risk. And he, having consulted widely about it, uh, felt that it was justified to do so. But he was criticized uh, nonetheless. So how has the law contributed? Well, first, just the, the first issue is the status of the organ. Existing law had emphasized the obligations to bury the body, but hadn't focused on organs as such. And of course, the main concern up until that point was uh, grave robbing. And there were a whole series of statutes around the world uh, adopted largely in the 19th century that forbade any um, uh, use of a human body. Um, and it was designed to uh, stop the commercial uh, robbing of graves and the selling to medical schools of bodies that had been exhumed. And so what happened in the law uh, beginning in the 1960s was that organs were redefined as something that could be possessed and transferred for transplantation, research, and education. And the possessor of the organs could give uh, the organ to others, could hold on to it, and could protect it against any actions by third parties who were not authorized to, to have it. So the organ was, in the Latin phrase, treated as a race, a thing that had value, but not market value. The existing law did not give individuals authority over the disposition of their organs after death. Um, and that was changed to allow the deceased to make a binding gift of the organs. Now, we all know that, in fact, what happens is that in all systems, uh, even when it is very clearly specified in law that the organ donor's wishes are to be, its pre-mortem wishes, are to be uh, honored, uh, very typically th those in charge of recovering organs seek the agreement of the family. And in today's world, that is usually done in a way that uh, makes clear to the family that they would have to need a very strong reason not to follow through on those wishes. But as a matter of pragmatism, the organ recovery organizations do not want to be in a situation of having to deal with an angry family, perhaps making not only a fuss within the hospital, but in the public realm as well. The third thing that the, the law had to accomplish was determining uh, when a donor was dead. And this had uh, been in, uh, his, in history. The law had simply followed uh, medical practice and had regarded anyone with heartbeat and respiration as a living person. And that was taken to be the sign. That was coincident with the views of religious groups. But it wasn't particularly a religiously grounded view. The religious groups had different views on when the soul might depart the d dead body. But from the from the general civic point of view, the law simply reflected the notion that as long as there was heartbeat and respiration, the person was alive. And this, of course, became very problematic once you had uh, means of sustaining uh, or replacing respiration, and then the heart uh, responding to that respiration would begin beating again in many cases, um, or would be uh, induced to beat again. And then you would have uh, this question, are you now looking at the results of ongoing mechanical intervention, or do you have a living person? And so uh, the law was changed uh, around the world. Um, slowly in some places, Japan, for example, was very slow to, to make this change. Uh, and uh, Israel also was uh, rather slow um, to 
uh, recognize that where respiration and circulation may be continued because of artificial intervention if there is an absence of brain function differently defined in different systems some referring to uh, all system all functions of the brain others to the brain stem in particular but all aiming to the same thing, that when there is a lack of responsiveness and receptivity and complete unconsciousness in the absence of um, drugs, anesthetic drugs or otherwise, uh, or very low temperature that might suppress the ability to measure uh, what you were looking for, in those situations, uh, a neurologically based determination of death was acceptable. Um, a number of countries uh, or, or other jurisdictions wrote into their laws an allowance for uh, religious accommodations for people who took a different view. But for the most part, this was regarded as something as a matter of civic um, uh, rule. And the general view was that uh, a person had to be dead for all purposes. It wasn't a matter of being alive and dead according to what was going to happen. So most of the statutes were not written in terms of transplantation. One very important thing that I didn't mention just now is that those laws almost all uniformly also address the issue of a potential conflict of interest and insisted that the persons declaring dead not be those who were involved with the care of the donor. So there would be uh, reassurance to the public that there was not going to be an acceleration of the determination of death to benefit the potential organ recipient. The uh, law also had to establish means to manage the collection and allocation of organs. And this is very central to the entire point that I'm making here. The public had to be reassured that the body in charge was going to be disinterested. They, they had, would have no individual or a group interest in the way in which the allocation was made other than it be done in an equitable fashion tied to medical criteria and that all the process and the standards being used be totally transparent. The law also had to arrange for a living organ donation uh, which involved providing standards and means for reimbursing for expenses while insisting that there should be no actual financial payment for the organ as such. And finally, uh, countries had to adopt uh, con uh, statutes and join in international conventions on interjurisdictional -jur transfer of organs. Um, and so the, for organ transplantation to go beyond that first case of a twin to twin donation, the, there had to be a great deal of activity by lawyers, uh, drafting laws and legislatures, adopting them, and then people, uh, as issues arose in individual cases, uh, litigating that and establishing what the law is. And so when we think of the triumph of organ transplantation, it's very important, in my view, to see this as a joint activity of physicians and lawyers, not simply a triumph of medicine as such. So with that in place, uh, liver, heart, and pancreas transplants uh, began to be uh, successfully performed in the 1960s. Uh, lung and intestinal organ transplants were begun in the 1990s. And by 2015, as this map indicates, the annual global total reach uh, 126,670 recorded transplants. The, these are data gathered by the Global Observatory on Donation and Transplantation, which is maintained by um, the Spanish government on behalf of the World Health Organization. And uh, remember, 60, um, less than 65 years before this, basically 60 years before this, there was one successful organ transplant to 126,000 by 2015. 
Um, the color variation on the map goes from the darkest colors, which have the highest number of organs transplanted per million population, to areas, particularly in Africa, where there are no uh, recorded data on organ transplants being be performed in the country, although some natives of those countries may receive organ transplants elsewhere. Now, I, I put up this chart. Um, which is a chronological chart. Um, what's interesting about the increasing um, numbers, the, the bars show the total numbers of, of transplants. And so the one that says 2015, which is the third in from the right, uh, is at that level of 126. Now, there hasn't been a decline since then, but these were data uh, uh, which reflected what was true in 2015. The 2016 and 2017 data are partial data, so that in the 2015, there are 102 countries reporting organ transplants, whereas the 2016 and 2017 data are only partial. But the, the, the little blue line um, shows the rate of um, per million of population. And that has been increasing uh, substantially. Uh, and that is on the right um, side, uh, uh, right axis there, um, and is now approaching uh, on a national level um, 60 uh, per million population. But, so that's the accomplishment. Now, what is this curse of success? First, uh, there is better and better supportive treatment for people awaiting transplants. Obviously, the main category for which this is true is kidneys with hemo and peritoneal di dialysis, but there are also uh, various cardiac, like le left ventricle assist devices that are used as a bridge to people who are uh, waiting urgently for a transplant and can be operated on and kept alive uh, while their uh, potential donor is located. And all of this is in the context of transplantation being not only a much better outcome for the individual, particularly individuals who spend years on dialysis, but also a much less expensive one for whoever is paying for it, whether it's an individual, an insurance scheme, or the state. Secondly, the second reason for this curse of success is the ability uh, to overcome end-stage kidney, heart, liver, and lung failure creates a demand that far outstrips the supply of organs. Now, in my view, this leads to this constant drumbeat that, that that organ uh, donation has failed us because we have a waiting list. And of course, what we need to recognize is that under any system, under any system, we will always have a waiting list. Why is that? Because if we today had 100,000 extra donations this year, and we met the backlog in the United States, for example. We have 115 or 120,000 people waiting. Um, if we met that immediately, what would happen? Physicians would begin listing patients who today they wouldn't list, either because the patient is too sick and it seems unwise to make a transplant to somebody who does not have a probable long life to live anyway, or Conversely, they would try to transplant more quickly people who were less sick because to do a transplant early is very advantageous, particularly for, for kidney transplants. And so we would, all, we would have a fluctuating demand in light of the success of the supply. Most tragically, however, even if that didn't happen, we simply have increased demands because of the incidence of organ failure being ever increasing. And uh, this is a global phenomenon. 10% of the global population, for example, is affected by chronic kidney disease. 
About a third of this is caused by diabetes, and somewhat more than a quarter is caused by hypertension. And this is rapidly increasing. Um, in 1990, uh, chronic kidney disease was the 27th highest cause of death worldwide, and 20 years later, it had risen to be the 18th cause of death worldwide, 18th most frequent cause of death. Only HIV AIDS moved up the chart of causes of death more rapidly. This it disproportionately is going to increase because of the aging of the population in places like China and India. And this is very burdensome on countries. For example, heart and kidney disease will cost the Chinese economy over the next decade almost uh, $600, $600 billion in, in death and disability. The two plus million people who are now kept alive by dialysis or by a kidney transplant are, however, only about 10% of those who actually need a transplant worldwide. 80% of those who get the treatment are in affluent countries. And indeed, five countries, US, Japan, Germany, Brazil, and Italy, which have just combined 12% of the world's population, uh, have more than 50% of those transplants. The other 20% uh, of transplants are occurring in the 100 uh, developing countries that have more than 50% of the world's population. Now, there is some good news but it's laid over the bad news. Now, this chart shows the number of US patients who are beginning treatment for end-stage renal disease that is attributable to diabetes. And that number, as you can see, those are the bars. That continues to go up, and these are the years from 2000 to 2014. There's better and better treatment for these people to keep them from developing kidney disease because they have diabetes. And so the blue line shows, as against the, the, um, the rate per 100,000 of persons with diabetes who are getting uh, end-stage renal disease, that number is going down from about 250 to 175 per 100,000. That's very good news. People are getting diabetes more and more, but few, a smaller percentage of them are getting uh, end-stage renal disease. But the problem is the rate of increasing diabetes exceeds the decrease in the prevention of end-stage renal disease, which is why the bars keep going up. These are US data, but similar data can be produced around the world. And I show you this map of the United States, which shows graphically that decline in the rate of uh, per 100,000 of people with diabetes who developed end-stage renal disease dash D, meaning caused by diabetes. Um, and back in 2000, uh, many, many states had that highest number of above 276 per thousand. Um, and that's all the dark blue. And then the next group was 117 to 276 uh, per 100,000. So most of the country was like that. It's very much decreased, but as you see, it's a regional phenomenon in the United States with some states doing very well and many continuing to have um, elevated numbers. Only the District of Columbia remains at the highest level, which is a reflection of its African-American population, which are disproportionately affected by uh, diabetes um, that leads on to end-stage renal disease. Now, these are, uh, again, there's some US data, but I just want to <laughs> remind us when we talk about what's the curse of success, what the success is. These numbers show over a 30-year period, this is the period in which this central operation called the United Network for Organ Sharing, which has a contract with our federal government to run our, our network of distribution of organs, 
these are the data during the period in which they were in operation, beginning January 1, 1988. Over that whole period, there were 742,545 organ transplants. That's an amazing number. This is in one country. It's an amazing number. That's the success. But the curse is shown in this chart. As of Monday, these are data I just got. As of Monday, the total number of candidates registered for an organ transplant in the United States was 125,000. 126. And that has to be seen. Um, and the data I have here are not quite as up to date as that. They are data from earlier in the year. But as of that time, of the 114,000 plus people needing a transplant, about 74,000 of them were active candidates. And the same. Uh, proportion is true of that 125,000. Some of the patients are, are too sick at the moment. They're still registered as a candidate for a transplant, but they're too sick. And so when we think about the ability of the system to handle these problems, we have to recognize there's a gap, but it's not quite as big as that. However, we have to recognize that last year in the United States, 7,000 people on the waiting list died. Meanwhile, there were 34,700 people who got transplants. So that sort of puts it in proportion. We have this gap, and it's even worse in other places around the world. Now, let me move on to this issue of the, the pressure to allow organ sales. Some of that pressure comes from people who have commercial interest in achieving it, but a, a, a good deal of it comes from very well-meaning physicians who are committed to the welfare of their patients and feel frustrated when those patients end up on the waiting list, are there for many years, and a certain number of them die waiting for a transplanted organ. Um, and this is a reflection of what we sometimes talk about as the principle of rescue, which is valuing the known person, their patient, over faceless, unknown, anonymous persons who are uh, potential donors. And even if they recognize that there is a potential risk to those donors, that risk, whether it's psychological or physical or social or economic, seems more abstract to them, and the patient uh, seems more real. Um, and that's sort of what happens in rescue. I mean, we sometimes go down in the well to rescue the child who fell in, and people even lose their lives in that effort. But we're not willing to spend the money to build the cover so that the, the person won't fall into the well. And that's the same thing that's happening here. The abstract risk to people is different than the reality of someone who is at immediate risk. Now, these arguments in favor of allowing organ sales that are raised by physicians in this circumstance are sometimes framed in philosophical terms. And there's an argument that uh, today uh, medicine is very focused around autonomy, and allowing people to sell their organs is a reflection of that notion of autonomy. It's what Mill referred to as the, li the, the liberty interest that people have to make choices about things that affect their own lives. Uh, also, the argument is often made, it's unfair that the donor is the only person in the transplant uh, arrangement who doesn't um, make any money out of the process. The hospital does, the doctors do, and the uh, organ transplant organization is paid as well. They're not for profit, but they all their costs are covered and so forth. And the argument is also made that we can't uh, look at the kinds of abuses we've seen around the world and generalize about what it would be like if we had a regulated market, because that's a black market. And of course, bad things happen in black markets. And finally, um, the central argument, the, there are, the argument that drives physicians who believe this is that if you had a market, we'd have all the organs we need. We would simply, like somebody who 
uh, says uh, there are a lot of bare feet and somebody says I'll start a shoe factory and he'll produce as many shoes as there are people who have bare feet and so well we'll just pay enough to get all the organs and we'll eliminate the waiting list. Now in opposition to that view over the past 35 years from 1984 when the World Health uh, excuse me when the um, the United States Congress first was confronted and a hearing was held and a doctor who actually, a doctor who had lost his license and I think was looking around for something he could do, proposed to go to Latin America and bring people uh, who wanted to sell their organs for a price uh, to the United States. And this so horrified the Congress, this was back when our Congress was still able to act on a bipartisan basis, uh, it so horrified them that they uh, just about unanimously passed the National Organ Transplant Act, which was intended, it set up the, the system that became UNOS, it uh, created a whole lot of other ways of increasing and regularizing uh, organ donation and distribution, but it also forbade uh, any payments and made that a criminal activity. In 1987, the World Health Assembly first took up the issue of um, organ sales and organ trafficking um, and asked the Director General to give a report and came back to that in 1989. And then in 1991, the Director General came forward with the first set of WHO guiding principles and the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution to support those and to ask countries to um, uh, adopt laws to implement them. And uh, that was very widely done around the world. Countries that didn't already have laws adopted them. In 2008, uh, the uh, meeting, the summit meeting was held in Istanbul, supported by the Transplantation Society and the International Society of Nephrology, reflecting widespread views within those organizations and the World Medical Association against organ sales and the declaration that came out of that on organ trafficking and transplant tourism has been carried forward by a group called the Declaration of Istanbul Custodian Group that has continued to work with countries around the world. In 2010, a couple of years later, the WHO updated its principles and then um, a month before last in Madrid, the um, uh, Declaration of Istanbul uh, was updated on the occasion of the 10th anniversary. Now this picture shows uh, the question of where do donors come from and where do recipients come from. The typical donor uh, data show, for example, from someone from the Philippines, from India, from Pakistan, from uh, a number of countries in Latin America, is aged uh, just about 29 years, is male, and has an annual income of about $480 US. Whereas the typical recipient, uh, and the example uh, in this article where this came from, from um, Der Stern, um, was described as Israeli, but it could just as well be from the US or from any of the European countries or from uh, the Gulf countries. Um, is about 48 years old, also male, with an annual income of $53,000. Uh, in other words, more than 100 times what the, uh, the donor has. On a global level, it's been estimated that 5 to 10% of all transplants involve a commercial uh, transaction. <coughs> And this is a highly lucrative business for those who organize it because recipients will pay between seventy and one hundred and sixty thousand dollars for a transplanted organ. Now, what arguments uh, support the conclusion that that's a bad situation, that the global poor should not be defined by the people who have a scar on their flank because they had no other way of supporting themselves or getting essential um, the things necessary for themselves and their families to live than to sell a, a kidney. And th the arguments, or let me just mention them very quickly here. First, there is equal respect for all. Uh, there is 
that's what's inherently wrong with the uh, the rescue rule. It privileges the the patients over the the donors. In decades of experience, have shown us, including in Iran that the physical, psychological, social, and economic harms to donors are very real. There's a terrible stigma, and there is um, a, a diminution of the quality of life for um, donors. Uh, indeed, the studies that have been done in Iran show that while about 50% of donors report immediately after the donation that they're glad they did it, they got money, they think that this will be uh, a way of improving their lives, after a year, um, upwards of 90% regret the decision and wish it hadn't been allowed. Uh, there's also the, the problem that the philosophical claims in favor of a market don't match the reality. The, the donors are not making the kinds of uh, uh, autonomous choices uh, that uh, idealized descriptions suggest. These are typically uh, very desperate people, and there is a spillover effect. For example, in Pakistan, where there remains, despite legislation and court decisions, um, areas where uh, commercial donation occurs, principally now within the country, but still with some visitors from uh, the Middle East getting going there as transplant tourists, a, a very awkward phrase, but widely used. Um, what happens is the people who undergo transplantation are uh, organ sales are very typically people who have attempted to obtain the kinds of loans they used to obtain within the community. And they are told, I'm not going to give you a loan until you've sold your kidney. In other words, you have money in the bank or, or in your flank, not your bank. And uh, why should I lend you money until you've done that? For also, the problem is, of course, donors don't re receive the benefits that are paid. And regulated eligibility and types of um, uh, payments that are restricted in the organ markets, the regulated markets idea, are such that um, the idea of liberty doesn't even exist in a regulated market. Regulated markets also don't prevent side sales in Iran. There is a, an open process of people bidding beyond what the regulated payment is. And the market on uh, purchase uh, leads to the distribution of organs by ability to pay rather than by medical need. Finally, the market commodification of organs feeds human trafficking. Now, uh, is this a situation in which we, if we follow the arguments that I've just given and don't have organ sales, we automatically have uh, failed to maximize utility? And uh, let me just skip over this and go right to some of the data. The first is, let's just look at Israel. In 2008, Israel, which had been funding people to go abroad, principally to the Philippines, but elsewhere, uh, including China and India, to get transplants, uh, adopted a law which made it illegal to pay. Um, and it, it, this is actually a crime with a, a um, extraterritorial aspect to it, that people who go and pay and buy an organ are actually committing an Israeli crime, even if they're not on Israeli soil. And you can see almost immediately a very um, dramatic drop in uh, transplants for Israelis performed abroad. Now, some of these are people who had reasons to go elsewhere because they had a relative elsewhere who would be a donor for them or there were specialized services that they wanted. But there was a very dramatic uh, reduction uh, almost immediately. These are other data uh, from Jay Levy, who's a leading uh, transplant surgeon in uh, Israel, showing what happened. And the, uh, 
the orange color are living donors and the blue deceased donors. And you can see, again, after 2008, there is a decrease, an increase in deceased donation, but also a substantial don increase in living donation uh, for kidneys. And obviously, with liver transplantation, most of those are going to be deceased donors, and again, uh, a very large increase. Now, um, on this chart, this this first chart shows the total rate of actual deceased donation in 2017. And I've highlighted Israel um, to show where it stands, which is um, not at the top of the list at all. Um, but compare this, um, uh, if, if you compare this to, to uh, 2000 or 2010, you would see that Israel had moved up substantially on deceased donation. But it's more dramatic when you look at these are total donation, total transplants for all organs. And Israel has moved way up, uh, whereas Iran on total transplants is much, uh, much lower. So to conclude, the paradox here is the physicians and lawyers who together have acted to stop organ trafficking have led to an actual increase in organ transplants. And the Israeli situation shows what happens when you stop paying for organs, you actually get an increase both in deceased and in um, living donation. So I believe that national efforts that will celebrate voluntary donation, improve the system of donation, and provide equitable access uh, to the organs is the way, as Spain and other countries that have done so well on this have shown, it is the way to actually have a much higher rate of donation than in countries like Iran, which is 20th or 30th, even though they have paid donation. Thank you.